Welcome to The Fairer Sense. With me, Tanya. And me, Kara. Women, money, and the fight to break even. Because we give a shit. And you should too. in a two-part series on the economics of wellness, women and yoga culture. Hello, Tanya. Welcome back. Welcome back, Kara. It's so nice to talk to you. Oh my gosh. Season four. I feel like we're officially like old hat podcasters. I know. I still don't know how we're going to make it to season 27, but maybe we won't even need to. Maybe by like season 12, the patriarchy will be smashed. I feel like we're doing really good work and I feel like all our listeners are out there smashing the patriarchy in their respective ways each day. So yeah, maybe just like season 12. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go with that plan. We are officially back coming to you from a country where breastfeeding in public is finally legal in all 50 states and it only took until 2019. (laughs) Get those titties out. Feed those babies. (laughs) Again, as always, laughing so we don't cry. Laughing so we don't cry the actual catchphrase of this podcast. (laughs) Yep. We're really excited to be back. We've gotten so many sweet notes from y'all in our our time off of when we all be back and excited. So thank you all so much for sticking with us. And um, a lot of exciting things have happened for us in the off season, personally, professionally. We are officially uh, award winners. Yes, we're sitting here stroking our trophies in a very inappropriate way. (laughs) Keeping it spicy like we do. (laughs) We had a longer season break than we've taken in the past, mainly so that I could try to feel like a somewhat retired person, which I am succeeding at moderately, I would say. Yeah, I think we both had a lot of um, really exciting personal things going on in terms of travel and just time away from computer screens, which I count as a big win. I count as a big win anytime I don't have to open my laptop. Huge win. I've gone whole weeks this year without looking at my laptop and it's, God, it's like a brave, brave new world. It's a crazy thing. I feel so lucky to get to do that. Yeah, but we are back. We are really excited about this season and we're doing things slightly differently this season. Um, Still crushing the patriarchy, still kicking butt and taking names, like that's a definite go. But we are changing the structure just a little bit this season. Yeah, we're going to go a bit deeper on issues. Even though we talk in most episodes for 40 to 60 minutes or so, we still come away at the end feeling like we barely scratched the surface. And so this season, we're actually going to tackle most of the issues in two parts. So today we're starting out with wellness, but this is just part one of a two-part series. So in two weeks, We'll be back with you with part two of that, with even more depth, more time to digest, more time to think through all the different issues that have to do with women, wellness, and our money. Something you hear us often say here on the show and also on our social media is that a lot of personal finance lacks nuance. And we tackle not just money topics, but how our money intersects with other parts of our lives. We've just been feeling that we really want to give that nuance as much space as we can provide for it. So I know we're really excited about this season and having two episodes to dive into a topic. I think it'll make for great listening. So stick with us, y'all. Absolutely. And it's going to let us provide more perspectives too, which has always been an important aspect of the show for us is getting to hear from voices who aren't the typical ones you hear. So going into two episodes on each topic, you'll hear from even more folks. Although total disclaimer, this time around, that person you're hearing more from is me. (laughs) I mean, frankly, I feel like in the three previous seasons... There just hasn't been enough, Tanya. You know, I mean, where are you on this podcast? It's just, it's like you're a ghost. So really, this is just you getting your your just desserts. I'm just going to keep lolling at that. Uh, but because we're talking about wellness, and actually today we're going to go deeper on the idea of yoga culture and how it's permeated the wellness industry and our culture more broadly. I taught yoga for 10 years. I sort of have a lot to say on the topic. And so, yeah, I'm kind of interviewing myself is what's happening. 
Yeah. And I'm excited to hear from you, especially because yes, we are talking a lot about yoga as it relates to the broader wellness world today. And I'm not much of a yoga practitioner. I've gone to yoga classes, obviously, and I've gotten my downward dog on, but I don't really know very much about the industry or I didn't know before this episode, (laughs) before we recorded this episode. And I think it's so interesting because I know a lot of people who feel very empowered by yoga, who feel very energized by yoga, but as always, there's a flip side. And so you're going to hear from some of our experts, um, and Tanya, of course, which I count as an expert in today's episode. But let's talk now about why we wanted to really dig into this and how maybe some exploitation gets uh, brought into this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's no secret that yoga is a pretty big business these days. We're going to talk about some of those stats later on. It's certainly something that most people have experienced in some part, you know, being able to put your hands into prayer position and bow your head and say namaste like that shows up in tons of movies and TV shows. And so even for folks who've never set foot on a yoga mat, there is a lot of familiarity with some of those cultural concepts because they are just so widespread now. We know that a huge percent of Americans have tried yoga at some point. That's true in Canada, too, in a lot of Western cultures. It's just kind of everywhere. And so whether you do yoga or not, there is this huge force behind it all that is affecting some things about your life and how you're marketed to and some of the imagery you see and some of the ways in which you're shamed that are all driven by people who profit off yoga at a large scale, what I call the yoga industrial complex. (laughs) Yeah. When I also feel like yoga has become so ubiquitous with health and exercise and it's very much so now like one of those things where it's like, well, have you tried yoga? You know, for whatever you could be like, I broke my nose and someone would say, well, have you tried yoga? (laughs) And so I think that's a really interesting intersection with what that says about the power dynamics, who's practicing, who is making money off of it. And I think that it's always important to examine exercise for weight loss as a means of control or as a means of making money off of vulnerable communities. And I think that we are beginning to really see that come through in some some yoga communities. Totally. I mean, we're going to dig deeply into the the weight loss question in the next episode in part two of this. So we're, we're going to set that aside for today. But it's totally right to interrogate how we view exercise, what we think it's for. It's absolutely true that yoga has become kind of ubiquitous advice from doctors to random people on the internet who write to give you health advice. Like anytime I talk on the blog or here or on Twitter about my disability, I always get that advice. Have you tried yoga? Like I kind of want to have a t-shirt that's like, yes, I've tried yoga, please. Like I taught it for 10 years. Please stop asking me. Yeah. I mean, that's like a joke in the disability community is how much people will say, oh, have you tried yoga as like the cure all for everything. Like yoga is great. It does lots of wonderful things. It doesn't cure everything. It doesn't cure everything and nothing does. And so we're going to get more into that. You know, you've got a decade of experience and I've got my intermittent classes (laughs) of experience with it. But I also think a lot about just how we talk about exercise and who has access to yoga, who is teaching yoga, all of these things really tie back into the finances of it. And I think can't be talked about enough, frankly. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, on a very basic level, yoga is expensive. There are ways to make it cheaper. You can watch videos and do it at home when you may or may not be doing it correctly and safely because no one is there checking up on you. You can do it at the gym where the instructors may or may not be properly trained, or you can do it at a studio where it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. It is definitely something that is subject to a lot of class dynamics because of that. And We know that the data support that, that the average people doing yoga are a lot better off than most other people. So we can't ignore that when we're talking about its cultural influence. I want to be really clear. Yoga as a practice is something that I love, that Kara, even though you haven't done it a ton, like we both have a lot of respect for. And it has cultural origins that go back thousands of years to India. There is so much there that's really wonderful. We're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about the way that it is now marketed by big business forces. Honestly, a lot of that is classist. It's elitist. And at times it's even racist. And we're going to get into all of that stuff. Yes. And if you are a yoga practitioner, it's not about that. Again, we're zooming out from individual actions to talk about the systems we're operating in. And to your point, the marketing, the economics of it to really get a big picture view of what's happening. So I feel like we've really teed up 
the meat of this episode. So let's just jump into it. I spoke with Thajal and Jaisal of the Yoga is Dead podcast, who are also both teachers and practitioners of yoga and Daisy women. And for anyone who might not be familiar, Daisy refers to the people and culture of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh and people in their diaspora. We started off with me asking Thajal what her definition of wellness is as a yoga practitioner and a Daisy woman. My definition of wellness is really a little bit like a yoga practice. Wellness to me is a consistent relationship with your mind and your body and your spirit for your mind. It could be in intellectual ways, really just engaging your mind, but then also finding ways to quiet your mind, which could be a meditation or a restorative yoga practice. Wellness also is comprised of the body component, creating body awareness. So that's very open-ended. I don't think it has to be, you need to be a runner to be well. You need to be a yoga practitioner to be well. You need to do X, Y, and Z to be well, just to cultivate an awareness of your body and also to cultivate how to rest in your body. And then I also think there's a, another piece of wellness, which is your spiritual body and how do you fulfill and nourish the sp your spirit. And then I think as a woman of color, I think it's really important to remember that one person's wellness is not isolated. It relates to a community of wellness. So where you live, who you interact with, how you access and resource food, what's available to you is part of wellness. You're not necessarily responsible, solely responsible for finding ways to be well. I mean, that relates to the community that you live in. So there's a justice aspect to wellness as well. I would define wellness as more of our relationships. So whether the relationship be to ourselves and all of the components they just mentioned are physical, mental, spiritual, emotional selves, all of those parts, but then also our relationship to our community, our friends, our family, and our relationship to society and institutions and our relationship to our planet. So I think all of those relationships comprise wellness because we can't be well if any one of those relationships isn't in harmony or isn't functioning at the best it can function for us. And it's so true. I mean, something that we talk about here on the podcast a lot is how our money intersects with other areas of our identities and our world. And we can't live in a just world when seven people have $60 billion and everyone else has $19.99. Uh, so something that really strikes me about wellness and its popularity in the last few years, the last decade probably, is we know that, especially in the United States, our healthcare system is essentially fucked. Right? And there's a lot of bias against women. There's a lot of bias against people of color. And it seems to me that wellness has sprung up as a response to that to say, hey, you're not being heard by your doctor. We'll listen to you. Or to say you're not getting the answers that you want. We have other options. But it's also very much so a form of colonization and taking Eastern practices and putting them in a Western context or erasing the originators and just saying, well, now this thin white woman is bringing it to you. So it's fine. So how are both of you taking up space in the wellness industry? And what do you say to folks that are perhaps seeking legitimate healthcare issues in the wellness area and in yoga in particular, since you're both teachers and practitioners? Now people are paying attention to other ways of healing because our healthcare system's a little broke, a lot broken. I think that's a narrative that makes sense to a lot of people, but actually from our point of view, it's been different our whole lives. Like we've had indigenous practices that we've had at home as tools for healing our body, for rest, for taking care, say, of a new mother. Those practices are very indigenous to many cultures, but not as indigenous to white cultures culture. And so we're coming into a time where, yeah, the system is so fucked and broken. We're looking outside of what we've always done as a status quo, but it's happening in the wrong way. It's happening in a really harmful way to the people who own those practices. To piggyback off what Thajal said too, is when you were saying all of that, all, all I could think was, well, we can't really have this conversation then without sort of addressing the elephant in the room, which is white supremacy culture. And what you're essentially saying is that 
healthcare has been infected with this white supremacist culture and which capitalism is a part of that. And then we have this like response, this wellness, this alternative wellness as a response. But then that too is now being affected and consumed by this white supremacist culture. So it's kind of, that's why you sort of have two sides of the coin when it comes to wellness, because while it's springing up as an alternative to what's been white supremacist culture's status quo, it's now also becoming a part of that. And then sort of to answer your question in terms of how we're taking up space, I feel that we're taking up space in not just our professional worlds in, in terms of like teaching yoga, but now we started this podcast. We're obviously trying to broadcast what the conversations that are really happening behind closed doors or in people's minds and they don't feel free to talk about in public. And I also feel that we're taking up space in our personal lives. I think once you have these sort of self-discoveries or discoveries of, about the world around you and how it's operating, you can't help but talk about it with those around you. In large part, wellness culture does seem to me like white people straight up jacking indigenous people's practices and history and stripping away the original cultural context for, to, to use your language, this white supremacist and this capitalistic context. And I'm thinking specifically of like sage. I have seen so many white women selling like cleansing sage sticks. And I've seen so many American indigenous people being like, y'all don't even know how we use sage. You're using the wrong kind of sage, <laughs> like, et cetera, et cetera. How would you like to see white people avoid colonization tactics? If you, I'm just like a white yoga goer, how can I opt out of some of the nonsense? How does this make you feel? Just like having to take up space when you just wake up and you're like, shit, racism still exists. Sexism still exists. We're tired. That's what, that's what it is. We're tired. We're exhausted. When you talk about how can white people avoid just taking and co-opting, I think you really need to think about where are you getting this information from? Like, is it just from a consumer space? Are you just walking into a wellness kind of store and then just buying a bunch of shit and then going home to use it and then posting about it and then reselling it in a workshop or in a way with your community? That's probably what's happening. I think the first thing is start to engage with indigenous practitioners, start to engage with the people that actually bring you this product and do the work to find out if it's indigenous practice or not. So you're not just mindlessly consuming something without any history. And the key here is like really understand the context of what you do. If you start to realize you don't have any indigenous practitioners to talk to, you don't have anyone in your circles that you can engage with, that's a really great exercise. And it's a really great space to live in because you start to realize how individualized you've become, how isolated maybe the community is, or how whitewash the community is or homogenous. And then you have to really like ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing if I'm not willing to reach out to the people that actually have the answers? Are you not doing the research because you just don't feel like doing the research? Why is it that you feel like you want to take like a little baby field trip into a culture without actually learning about that culture? And then why then do you feel entitled to sell that to somebody else or to promote yourself as some sort of expert? I know so many people who uh, they are so well-meaning, right? They're like, well, I'm not a racist. But to your point, there's so much to unpack for all of us in a white supremacist society. And even very privileged people, they don't want to confront their privilege because it's hard, right? And they're just like, no, it'd be better if I didn't have to, if I could just like vote for Obama and feel like a good person. And what I love is that you say on the show and you put this on your website that you said, if this episode makes you feel upset, angry, or defensive, we suggest you sit with those feelings and reflect on why your feelings are more valid than ours. I thought that was such a powerful statement. I was so glad you said it. Part of the reason we put the disclaimer was to say like, instead of immediately taking action, even if it's positive action, why don't you just sit with those feelings? Like do the work of yoga, do the thing yoga tells you to do and just like simmer down. Like your emotions are gonna probably be in some sort of bell curve. So like instead of acting at the peak of those emotions, why not act towards the end of that bell curve of emotions and really take the time to like think about it with a less emotional or less aggravated point of view try to use compassion as a tool. And then you still feel like you need to take action in whatever way, go for it. I do think that when it comes to being an ally, the conversations have to be had. Big thanks 
thanks to cloud accounting software FreshBooks for sponsoring season four of The Fairer Sense, the third season of the show they've sponsored in its entirety. We love FreshBooks, both because they've been such a big supporter of The Fairer Sense and because they provide the simplest, easiest to use cloud accounting software out there, which you can try by visiting freshbooks.com slash TFC. If you're a small business owner or freelancer, there are so many things you have to think about, from actually making money to keeping track of it. FreshBooks takes the work out of getting paid, so you can focus on doing the work you need to do to keep your business running. With FreshBooks, you can create a customized invoice, track all your income, and link a business credit card to automatically track business spending. FreshBooks makes it super simple to do your accounting, and it makes accounting one less thing you need to worry about as a business owner, so you can focus instead on crushing the financial patriarchy. Head to freshbooks.com slash TFC to claim your 30-day free trial and enter the fairer sense in the how did you hear about us section. You get to try a great product while supporting us. That's freshbooks.com slash TFC. I taught yoga for 10 years, most of that in LA, the epicenter of Western yoga. I came to think of yoga culture as the yoga industrial complex because it became clear to me that behind what is an incredibly beneficial physical and spiritual practice was a massive business machine that cared only about profits, not about creating the better world that it espouses in the name of marketing and exploitation. According to a yoga journal and Ipsos public affairs survey conducted in 2016, 28% of all Americans have participated in a yoga class at some point in their lives. By the way, all the stats I mention here are from that yoga journal and Ipsos survey unless I note otherwise. Yoga is a massive business. Yoga practitioners report they spend $16 billion on yoga clothing, equipment, classes, and accessories each year, a number that's growing larger with time. And yet, the very people teaching it are not sharing in that wealth. And the people who could most benefit from its wellness properties, namely those who are marginalized and underserved by our society in so many ways, are least likely to get those benefits, either because they're priced out or they're implicitly told they're not welcome. Let's start with the economics. The yoga world is ruled by Yoga Journal and its sister company, the Yoga Alliance, the body that certifies yoga teachers. Yoga training is offered all over the world, and the Yoga Alliance decides if a program is sound and includes sufficient training in everything from yoga poses to spiritual practices. 91% of studio owners say that it's important for teachers to have a Yoga Alliance credential, and 99% of them say it's important for current teachers to get continual training. A YA-approved credential costs a minimum of a few thousand dollars, with some programs costing upward of $15,000 to get a certification in a boutique yoga brand like Bikram. And that's not counting all the time the program takes, which you may have to take off work, or the travel required, which many programs build in. For example, some of the cheapest training options right now are in India and Nepal. And while these programs often cost only $1,000 to $3,000 for the certification, you still have to get to India or Nepal and be a away from work for several weeks. More realistically, weekend programs in the States cost four to $5,000 easy. Continuing education costs hundreds of dollars a year at a minimum too. Other things you have to pay for as a teacher, liability insurance, membership with the Yoga Alliance, because having that expensive certification is apparently not enough on its own, music, clothes to look the part as styles change, transportation to get to and from classes, et cetera, et cetera. So you're in multiple thousands of dollars with recurring costs of hundreds or thousands of dollars a year before you even teach a single class. According to Payscale, the average hourly rate for yoga instructors is $24.88, which sounds great until you remember that you might travel an hour each way to teach one class for one hour or hop around to various studios to teach an hour long or 90 minute increments. Making $50 a class is doing pretty well by yoga teacher standards. And even at $50 a class, which most teachers aren't earning, you have to teach 50 to 100 classes before you've broken even on your training costs. How quickly can you do that? Only 7% of yoga teachers work anything close to full time, more than 30 hours a week. A full two thirds, 67%, teach fewer than 10 hours a week, which for the vast majority is not enough to pay the bills, even though they are expected to be highly trained and to maintain that training. If you're just trying to pay back the cost of training, you're likely teaching fewer than five classes a week, 
more likely one or two, and earning back just the cost of training could take six months to two years. That's just to get back to zero before you start actually making money, and that won't happen fast either, given how little you can teach and those high recurring costs. But the entire system can get away with this because there are two wannabe yoga teachers for every actual teacher, and two people currently training to be a yoga teacher for every active teacher. That is a massive pipeline of people who will almost certainly never get back the money they spent on their training, not to mention the high cost of their ongoing practice. That's why only 29% of active yoga teachers can call yoga their primary income source. About a third describe it as part-time income, and another third as a hobby that makes them feel good. And 47% of teachers are independent contractors, so that limited money they're making not only gets hit with income taxes, but also with self-employment tax, and of course, with zero benefits. The economics of yoga are bad for teachers. In a free market economy, how do we let this happen? The weapon that keeps yoga teachers docile and silent is actually yoga itself. As I wrote back in 2017 on my blog, Our Next Life, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't have stuck with it for more than 10 years, despite crappy pay and sometimes unacceptable working conditions. But the love that so many instructors have for both the practice and the teaching of it is exactly what makes them so exploitable. And I for sure got exploited by lots of people sometimes in direct ways like being paid unfairly, and other times with the social pressure to maintain your yogic persona and not to complain about things. That's what I wrote in 2017, but Jessica Pishko wrote a piece for The Billfold called Spiritually Bankrupt, How I Went Broke Trying to Teach Yoga, and in it she writes, I asked my yoga teachers for advice, feeling that they owed me something. As part of the training, I was assigned a mentor who was supposed to shepherd me through the painful process of going from mortal to guru. Mine was an incredibly toned woman with tan limbs who yelled at me to straighten my legs in class. I liked her no-nonsense approach. When I asked her for help finding classes, she asked, how bad do you want it? Um, well, bad, I said. You have to give things up and wait for your time. The universe will guide you, she said. I wondered what she meant. I couldn't always afford food for my dog and gave him half of mine. I asked my parents for more money, convinced that I would break into the business soon. Check out her essay, which is in the show notes. It's really powerful and heartbreaking stuff. But this type of counsel is so common in yoga. The idea of letting go permeates Eastern religions, and it's especially persistent in yoga. In Hinduism, it's called aparigraha, the virtue of non-grasping or non-greediness, one of the eight limbs of yoga outlined by Patanjali. Asking to be paid fairly or treated fairly is easily turned around on the teacher as greediness or putting oneself over the greater good. This principle is drilled into us so effectively during teacher training that most of us never even ask those questions for fear of violating the tenet. Yoga is supposed to make us into better versions of ourselves, but by those holding the purse strings, it's weaponized to keep us silent. Now let's talk race, gender, age, and class, which are every bit as much a part of the yoga industrial complex. An Atlantic piece by Rosalie Murphy in 2014 entitled, Why Your Yoga Class is So White, interviewed a studio owner in a predominantly black and Latinx part of Los Angeles. She writes, you can look at all those magazines and you'll not see one woman of color, said Raja Michelle, herself a white woman who founded the studio. We associate yoga with being skinny, white, and even upper class. You go to classes and you're the only black person, or there are very few, said Robin Rowland, who practices yoga in New York and DC and runs the popular blog, Black Yogis. People who find my blog say, I thought I was the only one. The magazine images may seem like stereotypes, but they're grounded in reality. About one in every 15 Americans practices yoga, according to a 2012 Yoga Journal study, and more than four-fifths of them are white. Racism is so implicit that you never even notice that it's a white girl on the cover every single time, added Amy Champ, a PhD from the University of California, Davis, who wrote her dissertation on American yoga. But when you begin to ask yourself, what does yoga have to do with my community? Then you begin to question all these inequities. The piece continues, links between race and poverty are well documented, but according to Roland, the blogger, the problem isn't that people of color can't afford yoga, they just don't value it very much. When people talk about money as a deterrent, I'm like, yes and no, Roland said. People find money to buy thousand dollar bags and shoes and weaves, those cost hundreds of dollars to upkeep. But African Americans don't have a great track record when it comes to preventative health. Wellness is not really valued. 
And all those white women on billboards and in advertisements don't encourage that attitude to change. That upscale white woman is the image of yoga, Roland said. I think a lot of us see yoga as something that's not for us because of the lack of imagery of people of color in yoga. It is changing, but the image of a white, affluent, thin person is still very entrenched. That's all from The Atlantic Story. But in response to that piece, Chanel John wrote on the blog Decolonizing Yoga, the black people spend too much money on weave and expensive bags argument can easily fall into shaming, judgmental, victim-blaming territory. The solution to yoga's diversity crisis isn't for POC to change their lifestyles and spending habits to include yoga. It's the responsibility of the yoga establishment to break down the barriers that keep yoga out of reach for so many populations. I couldn't agree more, but that's also unlikely to happen when the business model is all about chasing profit. Back to those stats from the Yoga Journal and Ipsos survey. It found that 72% of yoga practitioners are women, and other studies have found that yoga practitioners tend to be much higher income than average. As far back as 2004, a survey conducted by the International Association of Yoga Therapists found that the average household income for yoga practitioners was $93,000 a year, a figure that's much higher when adjusted to today's dollars. 58% of practitioners are 40 plus. The most common practitioner of yoga, the one dropping all those big bucks on yoga classes and gear, is an affluent white woman over 40. That's why yoga studios cluster in wealthy neighborhoods, and why, even though I taught in LA, one of the most diverse places in the country, my classes were far whiter than the folks walking by on the sidewalk outside. When you talk about teachers, they are every bit as white as the customers, if not even more white. But they also have to be young, thin, and bendy too. Half of current teachers are 18 to 34, and only 14% are over 55. Some of my friends in LA who didn't fit that mold started teaching yoga, and they felt they had to explain themselves for wanting to teach it, creating their own names for their yoga styles that included an implicit apology for daring to be black, or fat, or over 40. We need more teachers of color, more teachers of diverse sizes and ages, more teachers with disabilities, and more teachers in non-wealthy neighborhoods. But that too is unlikely to change until we change the way yoga teachers are hired. 68% of studio owners ask their current yoga teachers for referrals when they need to find new teachers, which is the same way that banks on Wall Street stay so white and so male, and why hiring in general tends to perpetuate race, gender, and class barriers. When we look for people like ourselves, nothing changes. I still love yoga as a practice, but the philosophy and the reality have diverged so far from one another, it's hard to see how I might ever find my way back to the yoga mat. But until we can change the yoga industrial complex to be more inclusive, maybe that's how it should be. After listening to your fabulous essay and talking with Jaisal and Thajal, something that I just cannot get out of my mind is where is the money flowing in wellness and especially in yoga? And I did a little research and turns out, shocker, a lot of the big name wellness brands are owned by white people. And I'm going to name drop a few here for our fabulous listeners. Goop, Lululemon, Orange Theory, and Yoga Journal are all owned by white folks. So all of that money that teachers pay, that students pay, et cetera, is just flowing into white pockets. And I think that's hashtag problematic. Yeah. And we don't have good stats on who owns the studios, but certainly from my experience, including in LA, a very diverse city, the vast majority of studio owners that I was ever aware of are white folks also. And That's not a problem inherently. It's just that we have a whole industry that's a huge business and includes a lot of folks that's also excluding a lot of others. And it's directly profiting off a practice that is inherently spiritual and comes from another place. One of the articles that I read in Prepping This Stuff talks about yoga as India's gift to the world. And it's so true. And here we are commercializing it, monetizing it, making huge, huge money off of it without really paying any of that back or even oftentimes honoring the traditions that underscore it all. Yeah. And I mean, I think especially when this meets the intersection of like women, the definition of what a good woman or a desirable woman is in our United States culture, you know, we're talking about Eurocentric beauty standards. We're talking about being thin. We're talking about being tall, but not too tall, you know, and Mm -hmm. 
I think that it really gets into exploitation of not only the workers, but also just the people attending these classes and pursuing this body type. Because I would also say, you know, when we think about like a yoga body, I'm thinking like lean muscle, you know, (laughs) and that's messed up because you can practice yoga at any size and with any body, but it is reinforcing this narrative that like 120 pounds is like, what the perfect woman should weigh, right? Or like you should have clear biceps, but not insane biceps. Like we don't want Madonna arms, right? Because that's too much. And so it just intersects, I think, in a really harmful way. I think there's also an interesting thing that I didn't get into in my essay, but that I think is really important too, when you specifically look at yoga teachers. I talked in there about the inherent pressure not to speak up, not to fight for what you're worth, not to do all the things that we are here coaching women to do every chance we get. But there's this other weird thing, which is when you're a yoga teacher, people treat you like you are this all-knowing deity. I mean, I did it for a long time. The number of people who would come up and assume that I could help them with any problem in their life was kind of shocking. And You do over time, though, when enough people ask you that stuff, you start to believe like, oh, I'm very wise. I know all these things. But you are essentially a very low paid worker who's had to pay a lot of money for your training, but are then expected to perform at an even higher level of training because you're essentially by all these people seen as their therapist. And the number of interpersonal things I was asked to weigh in on, the number of mental health things I was asked to weigh in on that I was so terribly unqualified to weigh in on. It's, it's just, it's all part of this very broken system where we train people a bunch, although still in many cases, not enough for what they're doing. We, we underpay them, but then we expect them to work at a very high level. That is a system that I really do believe would not exist if, frankly, there were a lot more men in it. It's, there's actually a lot of gender inequity in who teaches. Teachers are much more gender balanced than the students. Most of the people paying all this money for all of this yoga stuff are women. Uh, but the people profiting from it are then more men, uh, but not enough to make it a more fair system. Yeah. And I'm thinking about what you mentioned in your essay of how in 2004, the average household income for a yoga practitioner was $93,000 a year. And I'm just like, adjusted for inflation, that's so much money now, right? (laughs) Or just adjust. Totally. And and it, it goes back to these narratives we have of who is worth believing, like who is an expert. And we live in a world, we live in a white supremacist world, right? And so we believe white people more than we do people of color, even when we're talking about a practice that came from a culture of color, right? Like this is an Indian practice. And we in the United States are now trained to believe that a thin high income white woman is actually the expert on yoga. And I find that so terrible, (laughs) like so terrible. And who's going to get the opportunities to go to yoga conferences or to be a speaker on wellness, right? And when you're a speaker, hopefully you're getting paid, right? And now the money again is flowing back into the same pockets where it's not needed as much maybe or all of these things. And that to me, I think is this this really vicious cycle that the more we can call out, the more chance we have of breaking that. I want to talk more about the race issue in a moment with a very specific example. But I think first, it, it is worth calling out that in a weird sort of way, the wellness industry is doing some things that are good, but they're not truly good because they're to the exclusion of other people. So in most career paths, those who are younger are disregarded, especially young women. Young women are rarely given any kind of respect. I think it's a joke, but a lot of us say this of like, I have to have gray hair for anyone to listen to me. And sometimes not even then, then women who are older will talk about feeling invisible. So you're really only as women influential for, I don't know, six months, a year. Like, what is it? It's not very long. It's not nearly as long as men can be influential. But in wellness, the interesting thing is because we do hold up thinness and beauty and youth as the ideal, it is a place where I think younger women often have a bit more authority, which is interesting because, you know, those stats I cited in there, the percent of teachers who are over 55 is very low and the percent who are 18 to 34 is very high. So it's an interesting thing. Like most of society doesn't listen to young women, but in wellness we do, which is sort of good, except 
we only listen to you if you're thin and white and pretty and you know checking all the conventional beauty boxes if you know fully able bodied all that stuff it's it's still a very very exclusive hard to fit ideal. I really, really recommend all of our listeners go listen to the first episode of Yoga is Dead because Jaisal and Thajal actually talk a lot about this and that's how they met. Um, They were in a training for yoga teachers led by a white woman and one of them, I can't remember who countered what one of what the teacher was saying with a fact and she had done her training in, in India and is a daisy woman and the white woman was like, no, I'm the expert and like, I'm not going to listen to you. And so it's, it's big picture. It's small picture. Like this microaggression happened and caused these two lovely ladies to go make this amazing podcast. But again, where are we putting our power? Where are we putting our dollars and who are we listening to? And then, yeah, maybe it's a win for a white woman to be heard more when she's younger, but like, are you doing it on the backs of women of color? Cause that's not a win. Let's be real clear about that. And I think that's something that we do have to really reckon with is we have a society that is shifting more and more toward people of color and white people are making up less and less of it, uh, particularly I'm talking about the U.S. population. But in the yoga world, if you look at the imagery, like right now, Google yoga or Google yoga practitioner, yoga practice, yoga class, something like that, you are going to see a lot of young white women. You are not going to see older women. You are not going to see fat women. You are not going to see people of color. If you look at the cover of the biggest yoga publication, Yoga Journal, it's virtually always a thin young white woman. I think most often blonde women. There is a story that I wanted to share that I read about when researching this, which is Yoga Journal. They are focused on, let's be honest, selling magazines, on selling ads. That is their business. And though they make that money, talking about yoga content, they're really in the sales business and they're trying to sell a particular image. Well, a few years ago, they put Jessamine Stanley on the cover of Yoga Journal, which was a really big deal. She is a fat black woman who's also queer and is an activist. And it was a big deal. But they got really cold feet in doing it and ended up doing a split cover with like a conventionally thin white woman on the other side of it because they ultimately said, well, you know, our readers can't handle this and they won't buy the magazine. Yoga is fundamentally supposed to be about improving ourselves and improving society. In Yoga Journal's own research, they tout how much more likely yoga practitioners are than the general population to be active in their communities, to push to make the world better. And yet they themselves can't even put inclusivity above the occasion occasional sale of their magazine. And they've repeated this a few times. Nicole Cardoza wrote a piece for Quartz that we'll link to in the show notes called The Cover Shoot That Brought Me Face-to-Face with Racism in the Wellness Industry that was very similar. She was shot for a cover for Yoga Journal, and they ultimately ended up getting cold feet about it and doing a poll on Instagram showing her cover and a cover with a conventional blonde white woman and said, which do you prefer? And asked readers to pick, which given that their readers are super white, like guess which one they would pick. And so they ended up keeping her on the cover because they got so much criticism, but she came away with it with really hurt feelings and also just kind of really getting a lot of insight into how the wellness industry promotes people and makes their business decisions. And it did not paint a positive picture of them. And considering that Yoga Journal is both the biggest publication, but it's also sisters with the Yoga Alliance, which is the certifying body that all yoga teachers have to pay money to, to belong to. They also own the largest liability insurance company. So they profit massively from the whole yoga industrial complex. And they, at the same time, are sitting on top of it, driving this narrative that is not inclusive in the least. I hate everything you just said so much. (laughs) (laughs) Not because you said it, but that is so racist. Honestly, just like flat out, that's what racism looks like. It's so like fucked up capitalist, you know, like it's all the worst parts of capitalism. And honestly, it makes me really think of when people are like, oh, are women electable? Or is America ready for a female president? You know how America gets ready for a female president? By challenging sexism and by stopping asking questions like that. You know how yoga magazine gets better? By putting women of color on their cover and actually walking the walk when it comes to their mission of inclusivity. Like if your inclusivity only includes women who are five, six, blonde, and between 100 and 125 pounds, you're not inclusive. You are as exclusive as it gets, buddy. We as a society feel very uncomfortable calling things racist and 
we often believe that, well, just because something isn't challenging racial hierarchy, that doesn't mean it's racist. It could just, you know, whatever. It's like, no, you know what? It is. That's what racism is. It's saying we're okay with a status quo that is racist. We are okay with promoting a cultural practice, which was ultimately stolen from brown people across the ocean and appropriated for our own profitable uses. And we're going to take that, that we stole, and then say that it's only for white people. That's racism. They recently had a piece about cultural appropriation in Yoga Journal, but it was the first one I saw, and it was in the last few years. They've been around for decades. And the fact that it took them until now to start to address that issue and still addressed it in a way that I think was pretty darn gentle, you know, that says a lot about the work that needs to be done. But I want to say, there is actually a lot you can do here. If you love yoga, you don't have to hear this and go like, oh my gosh, this is so horrifying. I'm not going to take yoga anymore. That's not the point. We're not trying to drive you out of a practice you love. It's just to think about ways that you engage with it. Some of that is, I'm not a big fan of, of subscribing to Yoga Journal. There is another one in the piece that's linked in the show notes about Yoga for All. They recommend subscribing to the publication Yoga International instead. You can buy your yoga teacher's insurance from other sources. We'll link to all of this. But you can just directly refuse to support a system that upholds this oppression. Yes, opting out is so powerful. And if you're more along the lines of me, if you're like, yoga, I know what it is. And I took a class to years ago, <laughs> um, I would ask you to really think about the people that you are looking at and the ways you're consuming wellness culture. So if you're only following like thin white ladies on social media who have six packs, you know, try and find some people of color to follow, try and find some fat people to follow. Health at any size is a real movement and something that we should be familiar with. Outside of that too, I mean, I do still go to like one-off fitness classes and Try and find a studio that is owned by someone who you want to support and work that into your lifestyle and your budget. As we mentioned at the top of the show, this one is a two-parter. So we're going to keep talking about wellness in two weeks in part two of this series. And we're going to get a lot more into size and dieting and how that fits into wellness culture. But I think for today, even with yoga, I still feel like we just scratched the surface. It just breaks my heart, honestly, to have to talk about a lot of these things because yoga is such a beneficial practice. It's been such a beautiful thing in my life as a practice. I'm so grateful to those who developed the physical systems, you know, the, the mental and spiritual stuff. But that's just not the way that it actually exists in our society. It, it exists as yet another tool to uphold the status quo and to elevate people who in many ways are already elevated, who don't need that elevation. And it's up to us, especially those of us who practice yoga, who care about this, to really demand that it be a more inclusive space. It's really important to remember that we all have power and ability in our own hands. I don't expect any of our listeners to go overthrow the yoga industrial complex, but we can enact change in our own lives and those have ripple effects. So believe in the power of your ripple effect. Yeah, believe, believe. And that's true for all of us, whether you do yoga or not. It's it's in all aspects of our lives. And that is really such a big part of what this season of The Fairer Sense is going to be about, is not just trying to shine a light on some of these things that are upholding systems of oppression in our everyday lives that we maybe don't think about, but also really focusing on the change that we can make as individuals within broken systems. Yeah, yeah. The system may be broken, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we need to accept it, you know? Absolutely. We hope you'll come back and join us for the second episode on wellness. And in the meantime, you can email your thoughts to us, fairsense at gmail.com, or you can find us on Twitter at Fairer Sense. And we are also on Instagram at Fairer Sense. We always love hearing from you and particularly on this one, because it's something that I think touches so many of us. We know that a big chunk of women are doing yoga and care about wellness and are in this world. So let us know your thoughts. We'd love to chat online with you about it. In two weeks, we'll be back to continue this really important topic. Until then, stay rad. Stay rad.
The Fairy Scents are Kara Perez and me, Tanya Hester. Editing by me. Our theme song is by The Insider, and all other music is courtesy of the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You can always find me at OurNextLife.com and Kara at BravelyGo.co. Stay red! (laughs) Oh, I forgot how to do this. (laughs) It's awkward. The ending's always awkward. (laughs) Okay, I'll try one more time. Stay red! (laughs) Crush it. So good.